Today's episode is a conversation we had with John Britton. F- yeah, my name is John Britton. Uh, I live in Western Massachusetts in uh, in the Berkshires, and I am currently working on a project that I'm calling Yes Code. Formerly of Twilio, he went on also to be the senior director of developer marketing at GitHub. He's had a very long, illustrious co- career in the world of tech. He's been a tech evangelist and a um, a developer relations specialist for a long time. He's now investing and working on some of his own projects. And today he talks to us about one of those projects, the Yes yeah, Code so, movement. You know, this all started with, um, you know, I'm a founder of a startup. And in going through different problems to solve, I found myself coming to the same kind of fundamental problem over and over again. And that's that as a developer, I have this superpower programming that lets me create almost anything. And even though I have that skill and that ability, it's insanely difficult to get to a finished product because everything is so rudimentary. I have to start from the most fundamental building blocks. We also talk a lot about investing, both John's experience in investing as a founder and now as an angel investor, some tips for founders out there on how they can get into that game and how to build that network. And we just talk about all things from start to end of investment, as well as all of these new changes in the developer experience. And so the idea behind Yes Code is developing a pattern for software developer tools to follow that gives you this kind of flexibility, but also is something where um, it's solving a problem, you know, 80% of the way for you and giving you the ability to kind of remix and compose uh, lower level primitives that solve uh, specific problems. It's broken up into about 20 minute intervals. So between now and the 20 minute mark, you can then move on to investing. And then from then to about the end, we just chat about the world of tech. So enjoy the episode. Do subscribe if you're new. We're found where all good podcasts are. Enjoy the episode. See you on the other side. So one of the companies that I really love, um, I'm also an investor in this company, is called Knock. Uh, so their website is knock.app. And I consider them to be a yes code tool. They're building a service for product notifications. So if you've ever used a service like Facebook or you know GitHub or pretty much anything that you log into, and in the top right corner, there's a notification bell that lights up when you have notifications. Um, they build a developer tool that lets you basically implement that into your app. And it sounds really simple at the start. Um, You know, it's just a little icon with a light that lights up when you have notifications. But under the hood, it's actually a very complex system. And over time, you know, it's more and more complexity that ultimately, if you're a successful company, ends up being an entire team within your organization. This might be three, five, 10 engineers that focus on this one kind of building block feature. And you will never get to the level of sophistication of an entire company that's focused on this. So, um, you know, I, I look at them and they have kind of these kind of baseline primitives of notify of an event. You have an idea of a user, you have an idea of a channel. So the different kinds of notifications you can receive, whether it's email in product notifications or something like a push notification. And then kind of a set of rules, a rule engine that does things like batching and delaying. And these are all words that as a developer, I can just say to you and you understand. And you can very easily think about, okay, how would I write a rules engine that says when a user does five activities within an hour, don't send them five notifications back to back, send them one roll-up of those five notifications. Very simple concept, but actually to implement that is quite complex. And so the idea behind Yes Code Tools is building tools that expose the right layer of abstraction to developers. Um, and so what I'm working on right now is kind of a combination of explaining and and putting down this Yes Code pattern and then going out and interviewing uh, in our podcast, the Yes Code podcast, people who are building Yes Code tools domain by domain. So we're talking to people who've built authorization tools like Oso, um, notification tools like Knock, um, member management tools, member stack, um, and you know all different kind of problem domains. And I think it's really interesting that we can get into the weeds about these developer problems but also basically give developers a tool that makes them much more efficient. So is it a no, is it a no code tool? Is it just like predefined no code blocks that you put together or how is it 
So know. I love no code. Uh, don't right. get me wrong. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of no code. I use tons of no code tools all the time. And the thing that I love about them is they give you this really nice admin interface and let you kind of just snap some blocks together. But a lot of them are just fundamentally flawed from a developer perspective. Um, probably the big, the biggest problem I see with no code tools is that most of them represent a walled garden. It's kind of this mentality where let's say you decide I'll just pick on one. I love Zapier, but I'll just pick on Zapier. Um, so Zapier is, you could call it a no code tool. Um, there's all different blocks. You can put them together into any order. Um, but if there's not a block that does the thing you want, you're kind of stuck. Yeah, you might be able to build a block just to solve that one problem, or you could use like an um, kind of a a very basic block, like a webhook block, to just do any arbitrary code on some other service. But it's kind of clunky. But really, the 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 walled garden part of this is that you build your workflow inside of Zapier, and I my approach and my opinion on this. Um, for a developer perspective, it should be inverted. Um, and so if you think about the dependencies in uh, no-code tools, it's build all of your logic inside of this no-code tool, and if that tool doesn't support you, then you have to rebuild it somewhere else in the future. Um, with yes code, the idea is that each of these services does one thing really well. Maybe it's something that every app needs, like notifications or login or members. Or maybe it's something that is very esoteric, and only a few apps need, but it's very, very specific, and it's totally orthogonal to your business. For example, know your customer identity verification. And that's a problem that my engineering team doesn't want to solve and doesn't have the expertise to solve and will cost us a lot of money and is not our core product offering. So it's a perfect case for build some primitives that developers can use and let them import them into their code base. And so with Yes Code, everything happens inside of your code base. And by definition, if it's happening in your code base, you can stitch things together however you want. Now, that's not to say just because they make it in your code base, it's going to be good. There's still a lot of art and design that goes into a great abstraction and building a great product. But the principle of it happens in your code base versus you build inside of their walled garden, to me, is a game changer for developers. And you know, it's not a new thing. There's dozens of companies out there already doing this. But I think what we're doing is trying to spot a trend and continue to encourage more things to get more robust around that. And the founders that I've talked to who are building these kinds of tools, you know, when we talk about the the yes code pattern, they're like, I totally get it. This is what I'm this is how I'm thinking. And I think it's really valuable to be able to talk to other people about it. This simplification of the the classical developer experience, it's just I'm hearing it more and more. It feels like we haven't the, the core experience hasn't really changed since like the, the 90s, really. It's still like a single, you know, you're a single developer writing to a single repo, a single code base somewhere, and then it's an individual thing. And that core experience hasn't changed. And it feels like there's we're coming closer and closer to this new generation of, you know, I mean, obviously, CloudSphere is, uh, CodeSphere is this new generation of cloud service provider, this kind of all in one thing. And we've, we've had someone on the on the podcast a few weeks ago talking about her no code um, platform, and it's just becoming more and more dominant at the minute, which is making the whole developer experience, I think, a bit more accessible um, to maybe... I'm not sure how yes code fits in there. See, that might be my next question. Yeah, so, so something that I've I've been seeing a lot and is kind of like a fundamental requirement of yes code tools is this idea of providing a control plane. And the control plane comes into effect when you're talking about getting other people involved in the software development process. So you as a developer um, could write some code that implements a particular uh, you know set of features and the configuration for those features might just live in code. So a product manager who wants you to change something might make a ticket, then you see the ticket, you go work on it, two days later it gets merged to production, and then the product manager says, no, that's not quite right, let me try it again. Um, the alternative is for an engineering team to invest a lot of money and time into building internal tools, so internal control tools, things like that. And you see companies like Retool that are building products focused on inter internal tools, which is a really awesome you know, product as well. But I also think about it as, you know, maybe we can just sidestep this whole thing of having to build the internal tools. And with Yes Code products, they come with a control plane. So the idea is that you implement these primitives, anything that's user configurable lives inside of the tool's control plane. And this allows you to bring other people into the development experience. So for example, um, I'll use Knock again as an example. Um, with their system, you can implement the notification center into your dashboard, let's say, or into your, your, your navigation bar. You can 
on the back end, trigger events, notify when certain things happen, and that goes into your rules engine. And that rules engine can be totally configured you know, within the control plane. The notifications are then sent using a template, you know, some kind of visual representation. And that visual representation is no longer just in the hands of a developer. It doesn't live in some cryptic code file inside of your app. It lives in a template editor that a product manager can use. They can do A-B testing and things like that. So I think that this definitely facilitates getting more people involved in delivering software products. Um, maybe not exactly getting them to be more more involved with the code side of it, but making it so that we can we can blur the line a, bit, a little bit around what are code changes versus what are you know configuration and what are things that you know the business user wants to be able to on the fly change. Am I right in thinking that this kind of like, uh, for want of a better word, revolution has already happened kind of like in the back end with like kind of the um, the kind of the development of like software as a services from like, uh, like Firestore and um, CMS is becoming more and more streamlined. It sounds like um, we were talking a while ago about this concept of front end developers, front end developers becoming self-aware where they're not quite back end developers, but they're not. They're not quite full stack, but they can they can do a lot of stuff in the back end because these tools are now so um, so um, flexible. And like you know, with Firestore, you can just kind of like it's a function. It's like one function, and you've got like Google login and stuff. Um, is this kind of like is this is this kind of the idea with Yes Code in the front end? Is it like a kind of a it's like a a, a tool that in, improves the developer experience because it makes it uh, like easier? Yeah, I wouldn't like necessarily call it a revolution, I'd more say more of an evolution. So there's tons of tools out there. Uh, for example, Stripe has been around for a really long time. Stripe is amazing at this style. If you go to their products page, you see you know 25 products across you know six or seven different categories. Each one is very, very tightly scoped as a building block or a collection of building blocks for a particular problem domain. Um, and I think that this is, when you compare to front end, this is a lot like having a component system. Um, but for back-end engineers, right? A lot of times, um, these Yes Code tools will come with kind of both parts. They'll have like a back-end and a front-end component where, you know, you understand we're going to use, for example, a role-based authentic uh, authentication system or authorization system um, might have things like users, roles, and rights. And those are kind of the core components. And then on the front-end, there might be a React component that lets you toggle a button to assign rights and roles to users, right? Um, and those might come kind of pre-made for you 80% of the way. Um, so yeah, I definitely think of it as this pattern of, of, of development of Yes Code tools is very similar to like a component system for a front-end engineer. Um, what I would also say is that this kind of evolution that we've been seeing, you know, I, I am a big fan of just developer APIs in general. Um, and you know, I look at things like Twilio or Amazon Web Services, and they embody a lot of this stuff up, stuff up front. The problem is they're at the very rudimentary level. So, for example, Twilio has an API where you can send text messages and receive text messages. That's great. It's very clear, problem domain specific, but one use case of text messages might be two-factor authentication. And if I'm a developer implementing two-factor authentication, I don't want to deal with text messages. I want to deal with this user has a device, and I want to give them an authorization code, and then I want to look at that code. And so with Yes Code, kind of the evolution of these tools is to put a higher layer abstraction on top of these fundamental pieces and make it much easier to work with these kind of complex business processes without having to implement them all yourself. And also the fact is a lot of these business processes are shared across every app. So having a company totally dedicated to that one business process is going to be, you know, 10 times better than if you have a small team within your company reinventing the wheel. Because mm. it's just going to save so much time. It's yeah. actually really, uh, it's very um, spooky for me hearing you talk about this as it's kind of like you've kind of created a company out of it because um, I've been, where, I, where I'm a developer, we, I've been working there for a year. And when I started, there was this kind of promise or this kind of talk about this component library. <laughs> and we were going to like, on every project, we were going to use these tools that we were going to use for React and Vue. And they were all going to link up to two different CMSs and it was going to work. And for the last year, we've been building it out and like kind of syncing with our design team and making it work. And now, like just now, like literally in the last week, we've kind of rolled it out where now we can just like take 
um, small components and add them to new projects and like spool up projects really fast. So if we're like a kind of um, in the world of like creative agencies and building building uh, products like over the course of six months and then deploying them and leaving them, um, we've kind of like created that internally. So that's actually really cool to hear that we're on the right track. <laughs> I mean, I hope so. I, th- I, th- I think that's where we're where we're headed. And to your point about it being a company, you know, as a founder, I think about what problems developers face. And I just kept coming back to this problem of it's too, it takes too much work to get started. It takes too much work to get to the point of actually feeling like you're making progress as a developer. And in an ideal world, if I could achieve everything that I wanted to achieve, you know, the goal here is reinvent the way we program, right? And it's very ambitious to say, well, wouldn't it be great if as a developer, every high-level abstraction I could ever want exists off the shelf and I can just grab it and use it? Kind of like a standard library, right? Like when you're a you know C C programmer, you import stdio.h, whatever, right? Like it's it's all the base level functionality. Now imagine if that existed at kind of a service level for business domain type objects. You know, your favorite programming language probably has an implementation of an array or maybe a queue, but does it have an implementation of a user account? Does it have an implementation of a team? or a tenant? No, they don't usually come with those high level abstractions built in. And so you have to reinvent them yourself. And so, you know, if I could, um, I would love to basically complete the entire library, but I actually think the strategy that's more realistic is to get more and more people on board with this idea of the shape of a yes code tool. That is, you know, it operates from within your code base. It solves a discrete domain layer problem. It provides an administration and control plane. It exposes a collection of remixable primitives. Um, you give them kits for most common use cases and getting started is plug and play, right? If you build your products in that way and we can get lots of companies to build that way, you know, the dream of having a standard library of pretty much every business practice will exist, but it will be many different companies. It won't just be one company at the center of all of this. So with YesCode, what I'm trying to do is find the people who are already going down this path talk to them, tell their story, and try to inspire more people to do more things that fit this pattern. Very interesting. It's very, like there's a lot of like uh, uh, adjacent or tangential uh, topics that come off the back of it as well, because I think that one of the other problems that this kind of solves in a weird way is that there's like this whole layer of tech content being so unuseful and uh, poorly made because you just like have these uh, little YouTube videos of like build a build an app with next and a, yeah. and, a and a data set like and a CMS and a blah 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 and it's just like I've done it and I, and it's in this in this one tiny example which is just like for is useless you're never going to use it again but actually like uh, seeing it in the context of an ecosystem and actually kind of realizing that you can spool up a whole project and say these are the basic parts that are done and they're live and they're ready to go let's focus on the stuff that's actually like challenging and exciting um it makes so much sense and it means that it's like what's that phrase like a rising tide lifts all ships it's like mm-hmm. everything as soon as one thing um uh pulls everything up then it means that the the standard gets higher and higher and i think i think maybe I don't know, you can answer this question. I don't know if you run into a lot of people, um, if there's a downside to this, people might be a bit, uh, they might say, well, you know, I want to build stuff from scratch. I want to do it my own way. But I think that like every other every other um, element of um, tech-based work, skill work, like design, uh, back-end functionality is kind of gone in that direction. So I don't understand why it shouldn't be the case that, that this this is also a product that people can use and kind of like level themselves up with. So yeah, not invented here syndrome is really like a real thing and I've seen it happen. And, you know, I think there's a lot of reasons why that happens. Um, You know, sometimes it's just developers like to invent things, right? Like they like to work on tough problems. Um, Another is, you know, vendor lock-in is a real scary thing. Um, People don't want to rely 100% on something. So I'll see, I see a lot of tools and products that are following the S code kind of pattern have a open source hybrid model where, you know, effectively they have an open source library, you can drop that into your code base, use it uh, up to a point. And then if you need enterprise features, there's a paid version. Or if you need um, additional capacity or you need global scale or whatever, they, you know, high, high security or, or different kinds of um, kind of angles. But they, they 
alleviate that concern with kind of an open core model in a lot of cases. Um, other reasons for like the not invented here, um, you know, problem. I mean, sometimes it's just, we don't know better, right? We don't know the thing exists. Awareness of a solution to the problem. Um, you know, it's easy to think that a problem that you're facing is novel and that no one solved it before. If you, you know, are not out there consuming the media or, or talking to people. And, you know, for me, a lot of times I'll have this idea of, man, I wish it was possible to do X, Y, or Z. And I'll start talking to people and they're like, oh, have you seen these five tools that do exactly what you're talking about? Case in point. Um, I'll use an example of something that I'm really passionate about, but it also drives me crazy, which is webhooks. I think webhooks are great. They're amazing. They're super simple to use. They're kind of, uh, you know, kind of a baseline technology. Anything can speak HTTP, but they're tedious. They're a pain to use. Um, they're not reliable. Security with webhooks is is difficult, if not questionable. Um, and re like reliably delivering or receiving webhooks is like a non not an easy problem. What happens if your service goes down and a webhook comes in? Well, it just doesn't get delivered. Do you re retry it? Uh, what happens if you're overloaded? Like, There's lots of little edge cases around webhooks. So I had this idea around, what if, what if there was a company where you could kind of outsource your webhooks and use a service for that? And it turns out there's a handful of them, right? And I had never heard of them before um, until you know I started going after the space. And I very easily could have gone down the path of just building that solution myself um, had I not done a bunch of research. And so it's it's easy to think your solution to a particular problem is novel and try to go implement it yourself without knowing that you know half a dozen people have done it before you and there are existing tools. It's funny, and this is going to sound like such a basic point, but it's like I think it stands to be said uh, that one of the points that we've we've discussed over and over again on this podcast that uh, it, it's so easy to overlook is just planning is just so, so important. And like, as you say that there's probably, there's probably five or six solutions for something that you think is unsolvable. Um, and I think it goes for the whole no code thing as well. This is exactly what we were talking to Lilith about a few weeks ago. Um, you know, she was saying that there's these amazing use cases for no code tools. Um, you just have to plan it in. You just have to think about what, you know, where, where you can get it to and like the biz in the, in your business is always going to be need for these things. It might not be your core product, but, um, you're always going to need it. And I think that, um, sometimes developers are very keen just to kind of just jump in, get their hands dirty and start building stuff in any direction they can. And then like retrack or any of that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I think, I think, um, even though it's basic, I think the planning phase is just so, so important for this stuff because, you know, putting enough time in, you're, you're going to find another example of how to do it or someone to talk to who might say, do you know what? That actually exists. So yeah, it's cool that you mentioned it. Yeah, I'm definitely uh, guilty of the code first design later um, just because I'm like so eager to get into things. But I, I, I hear your point for sure. Um, just thinking it out, having a, having a good plan in place and doing your research about the kinds of problems you're trying to solve. I also think that this is a lot more um, tenable in like a team environment. Um, when you're like a solo founder or a very, very small team, it's easy to like kind of not see the bigger picture. And in kind of larger organization, there's usually some kind of like sprint planning and, you know, a whole kind of ecosystem of how you're supposed to do this stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I want to shift topic now, move us on to the next bit. Um, I want to talk to you about investing. So you've been in the game a long time, a lot longer than Tim and I. You were at GitHub for a while, then you went on to Twilio, and now you are obviously working on YesCode. Um, but you've also been a founder in the past. You've, you've been a fundraising founder, and now you are um, an angel investor as well for various projects. So I just want to start with the broadest question I possibly can. And like, what is, tell us a little bit about your experience through those two, you know, through your career with fundraising and then maybe some tips for founders out there in fundraising. It's just such a big topic. Let's just talk about it and see how we find our way into it here. So I had moved uh, to New York City and, you know, for a, for a variety of reasons. And I was looking for a job and I was trying to become an engineer and I applied to, it's got to be 20 to 30 companies. And I'd get to the stage of the on-site technical interview and I'd fail miserably. And that happened over and over again. It was very demotivating. Um, and then I happened upon this job description for a company called Twilio that was called Developer Evangelist. And I had never heard of the job, but the description was, must love programming, must love talking, must love traveling, teaching. And I was like, this is exactly the kind of stuff that I like to do. I applied 
and I got hired. Um, I had never heard of the company before. They were pretty unknown at the time. Um, I was employee number 13, and it was a VC-backed company. Uh, when I joined, it was right around the time that they raised um, – I guess it wasn't their seed round. It must have been their Series A. Um, the funding rounds back at this time were totally different as well in terms of like the size of a seed round versus the size of a Series A. Um, and I had no idea who anybody was in the space. I didn't know a thing about startups. I had never worked at a startup. I didn't have a dream to work in a startup, uh, nothing of the sort. And it was amazing. Like it was a rocket ship. Everything was super fast paced. Everything was open and available to work on. There was kind of like a blank slate of what I wanted to do. Um, I learned a lot in the job and I had this one experience where um, I got very lucky and a tech talk I gave went viral on the internet and somebody wrote a blog post about it. It was Fred Wilson from Union Square Ventures which at the time I had no idea who the guy was. And so I just shot him an email. I was like, hey, uh, thanks for writing that blog post. You want to grab a beer? And I like, met him in, uh, in a bar in Union Square, chatted with him. And then like I told the founder of Twilio, and like, oh, that's one of our investors. And he's like a pretty big deal. And I had no idea. Uh, so that was kind of like my first uh, experience in the startup, getting to know a little bit about fundraising. Um, later, I went on and worked at GitHub. And when I got the job at GitHub, they had never raised any VC funding at all. Uh, and the first round of funding we raised at GitHub was $100 million from Andreessen Horowitz. First um, round. The first, first round. $100 that's million. So weird. Dollars. You know what? That's so weird because that's how much we raised in our first round of funding for the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it was It was just the, the first round. They were a profitable business for a number of years, and it was a basically a growth round. Um, yeah. And so those are the two main companies that I worked for that were – kind of VC. And then, uh, you know, GitHub was sold to Microsoft. And, you know, not that long after that, I decided to leave uh, GitHub and start my own thing. And just seeing, you know, those companies go through that amazing growth, and then looking at kind of the, the outcome for employees. So in startup land, it's really common for employees to get stock options. And looking at the outcome for employees, it's pretty impressive that, you know, you can work for a company for four years and, you know, make a decent amount of money uh, life-changing amount of money in some cases. And the problem is, you know, you learn about investing, um, you know, like typical retirement fund investing, that kind of thing. And it's all about diversification. And if you think about that from a startup lens, if you work at a company for four, five, six, seven years, you're not diversifying your investments at all. You're getting 100% of your salary from that company and you're getting 100% of your equity exposure from that company. And so the logical conclusion for me was how can I um, – get exposure to high growth startups, but also be diversified. And the niche that I found for myself was going and meeting founders that are doing uh, education, community or developer focused products and helping them with go to market strategy mm -hmm. and sometimes investing and sometimes having some like consulting arrangement, um, but all with an eye towards getting exposure to a diversified portfolio of, of startup, basically startup equity. And, it's a huge growth opportunity. You know, a lot of it ends up going to zero, but not being exposed to it is uh, is a missed opportunity. I think. Is it intimidating? I think because I, for my, for my point of view, it sounds intimidating. I think from like somebody who's used to like uh, a different world, and maybe a, maybe a founder who's like thinking, okay, I'm, I'm going to have to get funding here. I'm going to have to go down this path. Is that like a massive uh, hurdle for people to jump over? Like, I'm going to have to take this money to make this work? Or, or, or is it just kind of part of the game? Well, I, I don't really like looking at it as a game, first of all. Um, okay. it's, a pretty, it's a pretty, like, um, it's a pretty serious endeavor, like going down the startup path, doing fundraising and whatnot. If you're listening like, to this and you're feeling pressure, this is confirmed. It's a high, <laughs> high stakes situation. Well, I, I high, uh, it, it can be high stakes. I just more think about it as like, you know, it's real people here. Like we're talking about real people and, and real lives. And mm. I just don't think it's, it's a good uh, perspective to use if you're, you know, just thinking about it all as, um, you know, a game to optimize the solution for, right? Like yeah, yeah. really you should be thinking about like your life and how you want your, how, how you want to live your best life and that kind of a thing. And we can get into like, you know, my experience as a nomad, which really comes from wanting to live my best life. Right. So, uh, but anyways, to get to your question about being a founder and going out for funding, I think it's incredibly stressful. It's scary. Um, it's, it's, you know, the fear of failure is real. 
Um, and I think the advice I have for somebody who's considering to raise funding in the future is it doesn't start when you start your company. It starts five years before, right? And so, or even more, 10 years before. And it's all about building your connections in the network, doing good work and building a track record. And so for me, when I raised funding for my company, um, I initially started my company not with the goal of starting a company. My mission was to help every developer advance their career, right? And the way I did that was through an apprenticeship program where I hired engineers, helped them get better jobs, and we had massive success with um, in terms of personal outcomes. You know, we had one woman who went through our program who when she joined, she was a bartender and she did music lessons and she was making somewhere on the range of thirty to forty thousand dollars a year. Within eight months, she was making one hundred and thirty five thousand dollars a year at a top tier New York City development shop. Um, and we had you know lots of cases like that where we were making a big impact on people's lives. And when it came time to get more serious about this side project I was working on and say, hey, can we turn this into a business? One of the things that came up was, should we raise funding? And the way I approached this is I had already built a bit of a network in kind of the investor world through my time at Twilio and at GitHub doing things – uh, in the community, helping to build the brand of a startup, and I just went to some investors that I that I knew um, already had, and I had a good relationship with, and I asked them, and they suggested that it was a, a viable company to get backing for, and I was very fortunate in that you know the first couple of investors that I talked to offered to invest in my company, um, which is not typical, and I've I've heard from other founders that it can be a really long slog, and it's just lots of meetings, um, so. My advice, again, about this is don't wait until it's time to go raise funding to build these relationships. You need to build your credibility with these people well in advance so that when you come to them and you say, hey, I'm starting a company, it's already uh, an easy decision for them to know you, to trust you, to see what you've done before and to say, you know, in my case, I think my investors didn't say, this idea that John has is gold. It's we know John, we've seen what he's done before, and we want to back him, mm -hmm. um, and he'll figure something out, right? Uh, yeah. If this first thing doesn't work, he'll figure out the next thing. So I really think that the building relationship um, over the long term is, is the way to go for founders trying to you know, start a company, get, get funding. We spoke about this before on the podcast, like people invest in the person as well as the idea, you know, oh, yeah, so there's sure. kind of like credibility. We've also spoken about like then, does that make the road much harder for someone who might have a great idea and a great product, but isn't necessarily been in the space for a long time? So Absolutely, it's harder for them. And yeah. I think if you look at uh, things like Y Combinator, um, if you read the articles um, from Paul Graham, one of the reasons why they started Y Combinator was to give people a, a fighting chance at raising funding who didn't have the built-in network. You know, anybody can apply to Y Combinator. I know it's still a very difficult process to get selected, but it's kind of one of their mission statements that they're not pre-selecting for people in the industry uh, by default. I don't know how true that is. I, I can't make any judgments about Y Combinator, but I've definitely read that on their, you know, on their blog and, and stuff before. So I, I agree with you 100%. It's much harder for someone who doesn't have a track record in startups to go out and raise funding or doesn't have some connection already. And I mean, it's... Sometimes I think I have like cynical views on the world, um, and this is kind of one of those places where it's like, yeah, it's it's you know, I try to keep a positive attitude about all this stuff, but I, I also like do realize you know my background. Um, in some ways, I have a lot of privilege having exposure to these types of people, but I also come from a very modest, if not, like you could definitely call it like a poor uh, background, and it's just totally unfair the exposure that some people have to this stuff um, that just gives them a leg up on everyone. So you kind of have to invest the time and, and, and make the network and, and, and prove yourself in order to have an easier time later. And it's just, you kind of just have to do the work, right? Um, as unfair it's a, as it is for some, in some cases. It's a really, um, I feel like this, this is like another jumping off point of like we could spend hours talking about this, but it, it's also interesting you giving a personal story about that one person, like the way that you improve that one person's life and uh, talking about previous guests, you know, we had Clara talking about why, you know, starting with the why. Yeah, I thought exactly the same thing. Yeah, And it's like, I think that that's definitely the, the trick this investor conversation plays on my mind. It's like it, it forsakes um, like why you're actually doing it and it kind of like somehow like 
it makes it very cold. You know, suddenly you're not, are you investing in a company, are you investing in the people, are you investing in the idea? I guess you're investing in all those things. It's a set, it's also a bet against your ROI, right? It's, it's all of these things based up against if I invest this money, will I get it back regardless of the message, you know? Is this I mean, a- this is, this is the funny thing about, you know, doing angel investing. I fully expect that I will get zero return on every single one of my investments. Um, and I don't invest very much money, right? Like I'm not a professional investor at all. I'm a software engineer. Um, I just find it very interesting how startups work. And I actually think about it in a lot of times when I do this kind of stuff, I call it tuition. Um, and the idea behind it is it's money spent for an experience to help me learn more about how a certain kind of thing works. Um, you might not know this about me, but I'm also a licensed real estate salesperson in Massachusetts. Um, And I was buying my first house and I took an online course on how to do real estate, um, how to be a real estate agent. And I got my license and I represented myself in my first home purchase. And it's the same kind of a thing. It's just, I just love learning how stuff works. And so when it comes to being an investor, it's, I see opportunity in that I can be exposed to a high growth asset class and potentially make a lot of money. But I also love how business works. And being on the investing side, I get to have conversations with you know CEOs of up to Series B and C companies that are raising hundreds of millions of dollars, and I'm kind of at the same table as you know investors who are doing these like really big investments. And sure, like I'm, it doesn't matter to the company, you know, the the five or ten thousand dollars I might invest in them or something like that. What matters is that I'm seeing the inner workings of all of this stuff, and that helps me as a founder when I go and raise my next funding round. Like I see how this stuff works. Like there's a lot of there's a lot of multi-purpose, um, you know, values here. Another one is, you know, Dan, you and I can like talk about this specifically. Um, you know, you're go you're working on like developer go to market stuff. That's kind of my specialty, but I love doing. And you know, when we hang out and talk about strategies that you might employ. That's fun. That's brain exercise for me. It helps me think critically about these kinds of problems, get other perspectives on on approaches, and it helps you in some ways. Yeah, our relationship has become very like symbiotic very quickly. Like we started off talking about. Um, so Tim, uh, John, uh, we meet every couple of weeks, and he, he first started off with me just using John as like the soundboard and like a mentor and stuff. But very quickly now, it's just a uh, we so easily branch out onto all these other related topics that it just becomes more like almost like planning you know all the time now and it's really the same throughout this whole tech space as soon as you find real connection and talk to people everything bleeds into everything else and it's all about like you know how does the whole ecosystem work how do we find shared watering holes that builds every every platform at once that phrase you used earlier about the rising tide brings up every ship right it's the same kind of same kind of concept yeah it's uh, interesting yeah, and also when like choosing to do things, um, I always like to choose things that have like multiple ways of producing value. So it's not just like invest for return. It's invest to learn how business works. Invest to build your network and meet, um, you know, meet people. Invest to you know think critically. Invest to find people who are going after similar audiences and get new strategies. Like there's so much value in all of this stuff. And um, yeah, I, I really love, you know, usually it's, it's related to something like um, regularly working on strategy together or, or challenging each other in some way around, you know, developer focused products. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's a, it's really, really an interesting thing. But again, I, I really want to emphasize, like, I'm not a professional investor, right? Like, I'm, I'm a person who, who this does is, this, this is for... Not, this is not legal advice. Yeah. Well, not, not, not even the disclaimer, but just like, you know, this is, this is actually probably more the philosophical thing from my perspective is like, are you interested in something? Just go do the thing. Um, this morning, I went out to breakfast and I saw a woman wearing a hoodie that said Massachusetts Beekeeping Society. And right. I've been very interested in having my own beehive. And I yeah. just walked up to her and was like, hey, are you a beekeeper? And we got to chatting about it. And she gave me her uncle's phone number who has hives uh, not too far away from me. And I'm going like, to go over to her uncle's house and learn how to do beekeeping. No, right? like, that's cool, yeah. But like, the, the point is just do it, right? Like Just do the thing that you're interested in. And the question there was going to be then if you're, I mean, you're, okay, disclaimer, you're not a professional investor, but you have done some angel investing and stuff. So, I mean, what kind of KPIs do, um, you know, do you look for when you invest in a company or, you know, to extend that, what do VCs look for in, in fundraising? What kind of things? So I think those are two totally different things. Um, first of all, the VC is like, depending on what stage you're at, um, you know, at the seed stage, a lot of times it's like the person and team um, and are they working on a space that I believe in? 
right? So if they're going after something that you just are morally opposed to or you just don't believe is an opportunity, you might write them off. Um, if they're a team that you don't believe in, you might write them off. But if they're one or both of those things, that might be the signal that a you know traditional like professional VC might go for. Um, at the later stages, you know, as you get into bigger ones, like they're looking at you know real KPIs, things like what's your you know ARR, what's your revenue, what's your growth rate, um, you know what's your underlying costs, what's your margin, those types of things. I'm not I'm not that um, well versed in that stuff. Um, all the companies that I've worked for that raised money from traditional VC at a higher level were rocket ships and were just all numbers were up and to the right. Like it was, it was, it wasn't even a, a consideration. It was just like, you know, Twilio was growing astronomically, GitHub was growing astronomically. Like it was, it's very obvious. Any like every VC wanted to participate in those rounds. Like there's no, it's not not a hard decision. Um, so I don't know when it when it gets on like the borderline. Now for me, um, what I look at is first of all, is it within my thesis, right? So my thesis is focused on three industries: developer, community, and education. If it's all three, that's the best. Um, if it's just developer, if it's just community, or just education, that's also fine. Um, but I, I only look at those areas. And more recently, as I've developed my opinions around the yes code pattern, I'm looking at products that fit the yes code pattern, like developer tools that expose, you know, a domain specific that solve a domain specific problem at, at the right level of abstraction with remixable primitives. Do, like, do they follow what I believe is like the ideal workflow for for programmers like that's that's what i want right and so it's very easy for me to say is a thing in or out and then obviously the team and whatnot and kind of the last angle uh, that i consider is like can i help these folks right like do they need help with developer go to market um am i going to be able to be any anything more than money because frankly the amount of money i'm investing is usually so small relative to the round that like it doesn't matter at all to the founder it's more of just John is saying, I believe in you and I want skin in the game and you know, I want to be on the team supporting you and how can I help? Right. Like that's basically mm. it from my from my end. But that's interesting as well, because I think it bleeds into other conversations we've had around culture, because it's like it's funny that you say it's like anything but the money. And it's almost like that's the kind of staff that you want as well. You know, you want people who are like I'm joining this company because I believe in it. I believe in the culture. I believe in the team. And I've never really kind of glued those two points together as well. Like you should look the founders, or sorry, not the founders, but the investors that you are looking for, they should also, I mean, that sounds to me like the perfect kind of person that you'd want to invest in your company. That's just like, oh yeah, we'll give you the money, but we're here because of the idea. We're here because we want to, we want to learn from you. We want you to learn from us. And it's like a symbiotic relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, which again, it's like, yeah, I, I, is that very far from a lot of startups' minds when they look for money, or is it um, is it kind of like quite well known? I mean, everybody has their own their own kind of approach to this, but I've heard over and over again, you know, choose your investors very wisely, right? Um, it's it's like choosing a co-founder, right? It's like a very permanent relationship, you know, like it's it's usually a long ways out before there's any kind of exit, whether it's an IPO, an acquisition, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you, you definitely want to choose your investors wisely. And I think that it's, it's smart to, you know, bring people in that are able to help you. Right. And I think it's, it's, I mean, it's pretty common pattern to see, you know, a founder will go out and raise, uh, from a lead investor, an institutional investor or something, and then they'll go and have like a tiger team of angels. And usually the angel investors, the money that they're putting in is not material to the deal. Right, it's more just to give them a little bit of exposure to the company's upside, have skin in the game, so that when the time comes, the founder or the founding team can go to those people for their expertise, go to them for their network, and just be part of the part of the team. Yeah. Essentially, so I think I think it's very common to do that. Yeah, and, and just having a soundboard sometimes is just completely invaluable. Someone doesn't necessarily have to say like this is wrong, this is right, this is what you should do next. Just speaking out loud to people who are outside of the network can just really change your whole perspective. It's very, very useful. It's it's, it's quite um yeah, it's definitely kind of a, a a very different point of view, I guess, because you know, the questions around like the reasons why funding is important and burn rates and uh, you know, should you focus on customers before you do all this stuff? it almost becomes like a moot point because um, it's like you should just take the, you should take the investment because you want the support like personally, as opposed to just thinking, well, we need the money. We don't worry about the customers yet. We're just going to raise millions and millions of dollars. It's like the, 
um, the advice that you're going to get from those people is as valuable. Um, and you don't, I don't know, you kind of helps you keep focused. I've definitely, lose it. I've definitely heard from other founders that it's a real mixed bag as far as, you know, a lot of investors or, you know, institutional investors especially will say that they're value add, right? It's more than the money. Um, yeah. But then the reality, you know, when the rubber meets the road, um, that doesn't necessarily pan out to be true. That's a that's a very good phrase that I'm going to steal a lot. <laughs> when the rub, rubber meets the road. When the rubber meets the road. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, can't, I can't speak, you know, I don't have a large sample size. Um, I've been very happy with my investors. And I think that most of the companies that I've invested in would say that they're very happy with like the value that I've added, helping them out. Mm -hmm. But um, it's also something where it's it's possible or highly likely that it's like inversely related the amount of money you raise versus the value add of the investor. So like the investors that have huge amounts of money and they're investing very large amounts into you know further growth stage late stage companies, especially for an early stage founder like myself, when um, when you get investment from someone like that, maybe they're not as involved because you don't represent a huge part of their portfolio. Whereas if you look at like an, an angel investor like me, where every investment I do is effectively the same size and they're all very small, each one of them is pretty important to my total portfolio because i don't have that many of them yeah mm -hmm. um the value add from me is high right like or, or my involvement is high relative to the amount of money that i put in so i think that there's like that's a very common thing as well is like the angel investors are often operators right they're people who are founders or have been founders or worked in startups and the institutional investors maybe they previously were operators but a, a lot of times they're also finance people and they're they're in that side of it and they have a different set of expertise that they can help you out with. Um, so it, it, it varies. But I, I think that there's like definitely something to the like correlation of small amounts of money can still meet. You can still get a lot of value from those types of things. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Awesome. It's a very uh, – I think we were talking about maybe doing a season on investing and I think this has definitely piqued my interest in, a, in an area, in a topic that's like – I don't know, from an outsider looking in can seem very kind of like the yeah. the worst end of the stick. <laughs> you know, one more one more thing that I'll add to this is like, you know, it can be very um very scary or or unapproachable. Um kind of like with everything else. If you're considering to do it, I think the best path forward is to just prepare your pitch, prepare your 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 you know your talk or whatever you're going to walk them through and then start booking meetings and doing it and something i found was that from beginning to end of my fundraising process the pitch changed quite a lot not mm. in material but just in presentation to make it um make it stronger over time and just it's practice um, another thing that i think is really valuable here is my work experience has been as a developer advocate developer evangelist which includes a lot of public speaking a lot of being out in front of people a lot of persuasive technical speaking and i think that that kind of practice like doing public talks going to going to meetups doing that kind of stuff is a good way to get your you know pitch um stuff moving mm -hmm. and but like really just got to go out and do it everybody's they're, they're all just normal people right that's like, exactly like right. at the end of the day they're they they're not trying to put you down you know they're going to make whatever decision they make you can't take it personally but um you know they're they're generally yeah, you know, pretty pretty great people. The more I speak to people in the the world of tech or anywhere, the more I speak publicly, the more I realize that everyone is exactly that. They're just they're just people. So th then it becomes a much easier thing to do. And you know, yeah. So uh, that's a very nice segue, actually. Um, so you talking about getting out there, public speaking, and you were talking to him about seasons we want to do. Your new podcast is dropping soon, and you're doing that in like a seasonal basis. Um, do you want to give us a little plug on that podcast before we finish up? You mentioned it earlier, but like, what is it? Where can we find it? And who's it for? We just finished recording the first season of the S Code podcast. Uh, the trailer is going to come out on June 7th, and then we'll be publishing on Tuesdays uh, throughout the month of June. Uh, the podcast is an in depth look at a variety of different problem domains that developers have to deal with. Um, what we do is we talk to founders, CTOs, technical leads, uh, product leads on these products that are. Yes, code tools. Um, they follow the yes code principles. The, the they they believe in these principles, and they're building products that are delivering 
high quality abstractions in the form of primitives that the developer can use in their own code base and remix and compose however they want to, but with an eye to giving them a really fast startup experience, a really uh, complete package of the main kind of uh, the main kind of experience or the most common use cases, and then give them the full flexibility of code to be able to remix them. Um, so in the first season, we talked to um, Oso, which is role-based authorization uh, framework, which is really cool. They invented their own programming language um, that they use to um, to effectively like code your authorization policies. Um, we talked to NOC, which I mentioned earlier. That's product notifications uh, as a service. We talked to MemberStack. Uh, MemberStack is a product that allows you to do different membership tiers, um, and it helps you with payments and subscriptions around having different levels and giving levels of access to people within your code base. Um, and then the last uh, one we talked to is Super Tokens, um, which is also in the authorization space, but it's really, uh, I should say authentication space. It's really about login, passwords, different forms of login. Um, and so they're all really interesting and I'm looking forward to putting those out. You should definitely check it out. Um, if you want to hear more, just go to yescode.org.